So the book range goes over one central theme, chapter after chapter, which is there are tasks that get better with an outsider perspective or tasks where knowledge from one discipline transfers onto another discipline and helps each other. But I do want to preface this video by saying that this book is sort of close to what my life has been like. I've never really taken the time to introduce myself in the YouTube videos I've been making so far, so I want to take a minute to do so. I started my career in 2016 as an iOS engineer and soon after that I moved into Bangalore where I was doing the same thing. Eventually I started to take on more responsibilities like Android, the server and another language called Rust. We used Rust along with other technologies to speed up some of the software we were working on. This software was responsible for converting tens of millions of records into hundreds of millions of records. Speed was of the essence here and uh, just make a note of this because we'll come back to this in a bit. Then as the size of our team grew, I became a tech lead and I also took in design and testing uh, under my wing along with the development effort that we were doing. That leads me to now where I'm now an engineering manager at work and I lead two teams with the number of people quadrupled from when I had just started uh, being a junior leader. Parallel to this I also started taking my health far more seriously. I started pursuing ultra endurance events, strength training and I also switched to a vegan diet. And now of course there is YouTube also. Most of the examples in this book center around the fact that outsiders in a field come in and apply their general learnings from the field that they are working in into the problem that they've just entered. One such example in the book is of the Nintendo Wii. Now the Nintendo Wii entered a market where people typically cared a lot about speed, performance, graphic quality and stuff like that. Whereas the revolutionary mechanics of the Nintendo Wii made it so that it entered the market and brought in a whole class of new players that were just not playing on the traditional systems like the Xbox and PlayStation. And so as a result, they created a whole new market and never really had to technically compete with the PlayStations or the Xboxes of the market. The point that Range tries to make is that as the ambiguity of a problem increases, the breadth or scope of domains that you're comfortable with becomes an asset rather than a liability. What is an example of something that's a specific versus a ambiguous problem? A specific problem might be something like telling an engineer to go build a login screen which allows people to log in using their email and password. And you give them a design and that is exactly what they go ahead and build. An ambiguous problem might be something like I want to build a WhatsApp competitor and I want it to be ready and go to market in 14 months. This is an ambiguous problem because you don't even know how people are going to log in into WhatsApp uh, or the WhatsApp clone. Then of course there is the whole problem of what comes after that as well. So the, the WhatsApp example is an example of an ambiguous problem. This in general is the idea that David Epstein is trying to harp on in this book, which is the cult of the head start. Uh, you know, people who are saying I've been doing a certain activity or task since I was nine years old, isn't always the best at solving some tasks. They are great at solving tasks where repetition of the problem gets you better at solving that problem. The stereotypical example of this is uh, the tests in school or playing something like golf, where repetition really does get you to be better. The saying usually goes that you're missing the forest for the trees. The cult of the head start misses the trees for the forest, assuming of course that the trees are what is important for you, not sticking to the same old forest that you're so used to. It's adaptability that takes a hit in this case. This book is very close to how I happen to lead my life. Some of the choices were made for me and some of the choices I made myself. I called this idea of getting good at one domain by practicing skills in another domain as transference. Transference to me was the idea that you can get good at one thing if you are good at another thing that you are doing in life. And I have a few examples here for you how this idea of transference has actually helped me in my life. Coming back to the example I laid out earlier about Rust, one of the tools we use to speed up the program with millions of records. To get better at this task, Rust just allowed me to express the ideas in my mind the best way possible. What really helped was me reading books and practicing ideas that helped me understand how the computer works. How is memory allocated? How does multi-threading work? None of these terms need to make any sense, but the idea is I use my learnings from this exercise to get better at iOS programming, to be a better Android programmer, to give better guidance to people on the server, etc. Learnings in one domain transferred onto and made better the learnings of another domain. Another example is the one I've learned from physical exercise. The best thing that exercise has taught me is to stay self-disciplined, to make sure you push through pain and adversity and you don't give up until the goal you've set is completed. But one of the other things that I learned through exercise, uh, something a little bit more relatable, is when new people join us uh, and I'm conducting inductions for them, I give them typically an example to explain to them what career stagnation looks like. And this is where the idea came to me from strength training. 
So as your strength training, you go to the gym the first day and let's imagine you're doing the bicep curl where you just have, uh, let's say a 5 kg dumbbell in your hand and you're doing the bicep curl. On day one, you may be able to do 10 reps and just one single set, uh, after which you just cannot exercise the muscle anymore. You're, you're completely exhausted. On day two, that still might be the case. On day three, again, that might still be the case. You're completely sore. But on day 10, you'll realize that that 5 kg weight is getting easy for you to do. So at that point, one of two things can happen. You can either continue to just keep doing 10 times 5 kgs and stay there where you have stagnated at that level, or you can find a way to make that challenge a little bit more tougher for yourself so that your body adapts. So you either do something like two sets of 10 reps, 5 kgs, or you make it six kgs and 10 reps, or you make it 12 reps, one set, five kgs, however you want to vary this. But the point is you keep on improving and that's how your muscle gets more and more adaptations and you get better at the bicep curl. Now this is an example I give to the people who just join us as an example of career stagnation. On day one, when you start out, making a login screen might be very difficult for you. But as you progress uh, in your career, six months into it, that login screen is not going to be difficult enough for you to challenge you. So if you still want to keep on learning and growing, you want to find a challenge that is slightly more difficult and then push through it still. Now, I'm not saying that you don't work hard at your primary job, far from it. In fact, nowhere in the book does David Epstein seem to suggest that you can get away with not working hard at whatever it is that you're doing. It's just that if you, like most people, have multiple things that you're passionate about. You shouldn't feel bad about pursuing them and actively trying to learn from each of them. It's just that you can choose to then find a way where those different domains of your life interleave together and may be able to make each other better. Okay, so what are some practical takeaways here? Number one, it is completely okay for you to pursue different streams of interest in your life. You don't have to feel bad about it at all. Instead, try and find a way that you can use it to your advantage. As an example, you might be a programmer and be really good at cooking. There aren't too many people who are a programmer and really good at cooking. Find a way to use that to your advantage. To put together these different fields of your life to use, try and find general learnings of one sphere of your life and see if they can be applied to another sphere of your life. Let me give you an example. When I go out for a run and I need to maintain 5 minutes 30 second pace, one of the lessons that I've learned is it is equally important to not go much faster than that as it is to not go slower than that. The general learning that I get out of this is it's equally important to not constantly try to overachieve as it is to prevent underachieving lest you risk burning out or something like that. Once you do this, try and frame a problem that you're stuck with in one sphere of your life and state it as generally as possible and see if there is a way to solve it with another sphere of your life. Let me give you an example. If I'm in the gym and I've hit a plateau of how much weight I can add on the bar week after week, one of the strategies you take to solve this problem is you take a deload week and you don't add any more weight to the bar. In fact, you lower the weight a little bit. This enables you to recover at a much higher rate than if you would just completely stop. And then after that, you could potentially break that plateau and continue to add more weight on the bar. This similar thing can be applied to leadership where let's say you are leading a design team and a designer is finding particularly challenging a problem that they are working on. And one of the ideas you may have is to have them not work on that problem for a little while. Give them an easier problem to solve with. They're distanced from the problem that they're working on and they've hit a plateau of some sort over there. They take some time and build up their confidence on another project that is a little easier or simpler to solve. And once that is done, you have them work again on the problem that was stuck and this may help solving the problem of wherever they were stuck at in the first place. And finally, the fourth one, you being a beginner is an advantage rather than a disadvantage. You being away from the problem and bringing a fresh perspective to the problem is something that is advantageous to the team rather than disadvantageous. Make sure that your fresh perspective is maintained and you're questioning whatever it is that you're entering for the first time and not accepting dogma as fact. And to sort of bring this whole video together back full circle, you would have heard of this quote a lot which is Jack of all trades, master of none. And this book is the place where I found out the full version of that quote. The full version of that quote is Jack of all trades, master of none, but is still better than a master of one. So that's all from me for this video. If you find yourself wanting to pursue different activities, go for it because you never know what beautiful outcomes your particular mishmash of ideas might produce. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.